Good evening, town meeting. It's my pleasure to present to you tonight the citizen's article that is the next step in a long, many-year process to address the phenomenon of large new houses in Lexington. To guide this presentation, I will first characterize the problem and then describe the approach undertaken to develop solutions. Then I will address some common questions from the public outreach process and will close with a summary. In the early 1990s, the Lexington Planning Department started to notice a growing trend in the construction of new homes that were much larger than those in existing neighborhoods. In 1997, in response to a large amount of comments from the public expressing concern and anxiety regarding this growing trend, the Planning Board wrote a report called the Large House Study, in which they characterized the trend to date and suggested potential policy and mitigation options. Fast forward five years to 2002, when Lexington's previous comprehensive plan was completed. The plan wrote that the demolition and replacement of existing homes was eroding the town's once rich diversity of housing, resulting in a quote-unquote monoculture of only large and expensive new homes. The plan further called for mitigation in the form of zoning policy to slow this process of change. Fast forward to 2015, when the planning board held a public listening session, which resulted in the establishment of the Ad Hoc Residential Policy Committee, or RPC. Through research, data collection, and public workshops, a wide range of housing issues were identified, including the need for more restrictive zoning, such as new height and size limits on houses. In the planning board's 2016 report to town meeting, the board noted that the replacement of existing homes with large new construction was accelerating and negatively impacting property owners and neighborhoods. In 2016, town meeting overwhelmingly supported the first ever limits on single lot residential floor area and that by regulating the size of buildings, we can encourage smaller and medium-sized housing and help address negative impacts on property owners. There are a number of dimensional controls that are often used in residential zoning, such as setbacks, how far must a house be from the front, side, and rear lot lines, site coverage, how much of the lot can be covered by buildings, height limits, how tall can the house be above the average natural grade, and floor area limits, how large can a house be in proportion to the size of the lot on which it resides? There are two definitions of floor area that I will use in this presentation. Gross floor area, or GFA, which is essentially a measurement of the total floor area inside the envelope of the building. And finished living area, which is a measure of the inhabitable areas of the building that meet certain height requirements. In Lexington, different parts of the building are combined to form the measure of GFA, including all horizontal areas of all stories of all buildings on the same lot, any half-stories, garages, basements, cellars, and porches. Excluded from Lexington's definition are attics, crawl spaces, and decks. At the time of permitting, there is a process for how the GFA bylaw is implemented. Applicants take the total size of the lot in square feet and perform a calculation to determine the maximum allowable GFA permitted on the lot. The applicant defines the total building areas from the architect's plans at permitting time the zoning administrator and the building commissioner oversee and enforce this process. The implementation of the 2016 bylaw did not ameliorate the issue of large new houses, and during the public outreach process for the 2022 comprehensive plan, the sentiment surrounding large new construction and teardowns was the second most commented on housing topic after affordable housing. As such, the Comprehensive Plan Advisory Committee, and later the Planning Board, solidified an immediate plan action to further limit GFA in order to manage the impact of large homes. Similar to the sentiments from the Comprehensive Plan Public Outreach, Lexington's townwide survey has also cataloged a consistent trend in that residents are frustrated by the loss of smaller homes, the persistent building activity across town, and the construction of new large homes. We can also see those trends and sentiment through data. An analysis was undertaken that compared Lexington's entire single-family housing inventory as it was built in 2007 to the as-built inventory in 2022. Through this analysis, we can compare what housing was removed from the inventory through demolition and what replaced it through new construction. And the plot on the slide represents the change in that inventory with the red bars denoting the number of single-family homes demolished and the blue bars denoting the number of new houses constructed. What we see is that over 1,000 homes, or roughly 11% of the entire single-family inventory, has been replaced in the last 15 years, and that smaller houses were replaced by a wide spectrum of larger houses. Over this entire period, new single-family houses were on average 2.7 times larger than the ones they replaced. We can also look at the trend in house size over time. The blue line represents the median size of new construction per year. The red line is a statistical fit to this data showing the nature of the overall upward trend in size over time. 
We can also look at the trend nationally and regionally, with the blue bar representing the distribution of new construction from the entire United States, and the red bar representing new construction for the entire Northeast. More locally, the yellow bar represents the new construction distribution across all of Middlesex County, and the purple bar represents only Lexington. As can be seen, the size of new single-family housing in Lexington is almost entirely comprised of homes greater than 4,000 square feet finished living area. We know that nationally, builders are responding to changes in housing needs from the pandemic, such as including more home office spaces and increased options for intergenerational living. But this does not explain why houses in Lexington are so much bigger than everywhere else. We can also look at this trend in a slightly different way by examining housing amenities, such as the number of bathrooms. But here again, Lexington is an outlier. In 2021, the median number of bathrooms in new single-family construction in Lexington was five and a half bathrooms. When you compare this to the latest demographic data for Lexington, which estimates the average Lexington household to be comprised of 2.75 people, this is akin to providing two bathrooms per person. Another significant trend is that of maximization of opportunity when new development takes place. Many new homes built are being architecturally designed in such a way so that they can make use of almost all of the allowable GFA afforded by the lot. On the slide are several examples built in Lexington over the last few years, illustrating GFA utilization of 97% to almost 100%, including the house in the bottom left that is built to 99.99%, one square foot less than the maximum allowable GFA. With these trends in mind, next I will discuss exactly what is being proposed under this article. The purpose of Article 40 is to respond to the long-standing need for action to address large, new, single-lot housing. To do this, a data-driven approach was used to collect and analyze relevant data and then model and assess the impacts of potential reductions in allowable GFA. In parallel, a multi-year outreach process has taken place with residents, town staff, the housing development community, and discussions with planning departments and peer municipalities. The end state of this was to produce a well-researched proposal that has incorporated feedback and compromises from a wide range of stakeholders. The central change being proposed under Article 40 is a reduction in the allowable GFA for new single-lot house development, which was derived through a systematic process that included a review of the previous work of the first GFA bylaw from the Residential Policy Committee's Dimensional Controls Working Group, a review of Lexington's peer communities to see how they regulate building sizes and how they are addressing the phenomena of housing redevelopment, discussions with architects and development teams to gather input and solicit feedback, first-hand collection and analysis of 160 new construction permits and related floor plans for homes built in Lexington in the past three years, and finally, evaluating potential policy options through a fiscal and financial lens. For the outreach with the development community, over 30 development teams working in Lexington were identified and contacted. Engagement from these communications include email, phone conversations, and in-person site visits with development teams. 27% of those who were contacted engaged in the process and provided general feedback, including that current sales substantiate that there is market demand for large homes, that the effort to reduce GFA is misguided, and that GFA is already too restrictive for developers. The objective of this outreach effort was to make sure the development community was aware of this proposal and to create an opportunity for input and feedback. Article 40 actually began its life in 2020 as Article 46. Right in the middle of the public hearing process, the COVID-19 pandemic struck, and I decided later that June to refer Article 46 to the Planning Board for subsequent action. Between 2020 and 2022, I continued to research, collect data, and analyze this issue in the event that the Planning Board did not pick up the work and on January 19th of this year, Article 40 was proposed and posted to the town website. Throughout the public hearing process, planning board members, town staff, residents, and others raised questions and provided feedback on both the wording and the mechanics of the bylaw language, which were subsequently addressed point by point to refine the initial motion. Through the first two weeks of March, multiple working meetings and emails with town staff and council took place to resolve any concerns and how the bylaw might be interpreted legally and to resolve any ambiguities and how the bylaw would be implemented in the day-to-day -day operations of the zoning administrator and the building commissioner. Article 40, in effect, proposes one simple change. If you construct a new single lot dwelling after January 1st, 2024, it should be smaller in GFA than what is currently allowed today. The table below provides examples for different lot sizes of how much GFA is allowed today and the proposed reduction in that allowance. On smaller lots, such as a 5,000 square foot lot, this represents about a 5% reduction in allowable GFA. 
and on a 30,000 square foot lot, this represents around a 23% reduction with the amount of reduction designed proportionally to the increasing size of the lot. Construction of new single lot dwellings after January 1st, 2024 includes wholly new structures on previous vacant land or an existing structure that has had more than 50% of the primary building's exterior shell demolished. This criteria is adopted from a similar provision in the Town of Needham's zoning bylaw, and it was incorporated at the request of town staff for lots where there are existing buildings that were constructed before January 1st, 2024. There would be no change and no reduction in allowable GFA. These properties could be extended, altered, and structurally changed up to the current limits and retain all the stored value and potential therein. An analysis of the zoning bylaws of peer communities who also regulate floor area and who have residential development similar to Lexington was performed. Of those that met the criteria were Brookline, Concord, Newton, and Weston. For each of the four municipalities, an assessment was performed that included determining which residential districts are similar to Lexington's districts, and then compensating for differences in the building area definitions of gross floor area used in each municipality. The findings from this analysis indicate that Lexington's current bylaw is substantially more permissive than the like communities in the comparison. If Article 40 were to be adopted, Lexington would be brought much closer in alignment with these communities. We would not be the most permissive, nor the most restrictive, but achieving a balance in between. So what kind of houses could be constructed under the new limits? Here are 15 homes built in Lexington in the last few years that range from around 3,600 square feet GFA to 5,400 square feet GFA and all could be built again under Article 40, depending on the lot. Here are another 15 homes built in Lexington in the last few years that range from around 5,400 square feet GFA to 6,300 square foot GFA, and all could be built again under Article 40, depending on the lot. Simply put, the intent of this change is that when redevelopment does occur, that it be smaller, and the 30 properties just shown demonstrate that these smaller homes are being built today and would likely continue to be built in the future. Next. How will what is proposed under Article 40 affect Lexington's current conventional subdivision alternative bylaws and the ones being proposed this town meeting? Lexington's existing special permit residential development bylaw has three options, two of which determine their allowable GFA using a formula internal to the bylaw and thus would not be impacted by Article 40. The other special permit residential development option, site sensitive developments, would fall under the new lower GFA limits, which keeps this special permit option at parity with that of the conventional subdivision. Lexington's recently passed open space residential development by law is exempted from the new limits under Article 40. This provides an incentive for development teams to choose an OSRD instead of a conventional subdivision. Article 33, special residential developments, also uses a formula internal to the bylaw, and thus the current GFA limits and those proposed under Article 40 do not apply. If Article 40 were adopted, the allowable total GFA for a conventional subdivision would be less, and thus providing an additional incentive for SRDs beyond those already included in the Article 33 proposed bylaw. Lastly, none of Lexington's residential GFA limits would apply to multifamily housing under Article 34. While regulating building floor area in proportion to the size of a lot is a useful tool, it is also an imperfect one that has some limitations and associated caveats. Zoning such as this cannot directly address the challenges associated with affordability of housing, nor the prevalence of redevelopment. At its core, the purpose of zoning is to achieve a careful balance between shared community and individual property rights, and this proposed change is another example of striking such a balance. Lastly, real property is an important financial asset, but return on investment is only one of many factors of why people own property and zoning regulations should neither be minimized or maximized with the intent of shaping return on investment, nor should common sense solutions be precluded by arguments of hypothetical loss of unrealized gains. Next, I will address some commonly asked questions. First, will this proposed change affect residential property values? In 2016, before town meeting was to debate our current GFA by law, anonymous mailers were sent to Lexington residents suggesting that their individual property values could decrease by up to $200,000 should floor area limits be adopted. To look at the hypothetical value loss of property owners from the implementation of the 2016 GFA bylaw, sales records were collected for all properties that were purchased and later redeveloped for the two years before the adoption of the GFA bylaw and for the two years after the adoption of the GFA bylaw. This resulted in a data set of 196 teardown lot purchases 
a combination of both public real estate brokered MLS sales and private direct-to-developer sales. Each sale was then adjusted for inflation to a common time frame so that all values could be compared apples to apples. In the table shown, the second column represents the median developer purchase price for the two years before the GFA bylaw implementation, and the third column represents the median purchase price for the two years after the GFA bylaw implementation, and the fourth column represents the percent difference between the before and after median values. As can be seen across each row, the before and after differences are all positive and show an increase in median price ranging from approximately 3.7% to 10% after the GFA bylaw was implemented and known to developers. This indicates that property owners did not systematically receive lower offers for their properties after the passage of GFA restrictions. A local real estate brokerage also tracks off-market direct-to-developer sales of teardown lots as part of a periodic Lexington Market Review report. With the bar chart de-emphasized, we can focus on evaluating the red line which is the average direct-to-developer sale price for teardown lots in a given year, and the blue line, which is the average sale price of the new construction resulting from off-market teardown lots in a given year. There are two findings of interest. First, in looking at the red line from 2014 to 2018, it can be seen that there is no systematic decrease average developer offers to property owners after 2016. This is consistent with the analysis shown on the previous slide, and helps validate that independent finding. Second, the authors of the market review noted that in 2021 and 2022, the sale price of new construction rose 36%, but the off-market teardown price remained the same. This divergence could be due to a number of factors, but suggests that off-market offers for teardown lots are not keeping pace with the overall market price of new construction as they had in the past. Next, will this proposed change affect residential tax revenue? In 2016, during the debate of the first GFA bylaw, the Appropriation Committee commented on a fiscal analysis that was undertaken to look at the potential impact of tax revenues and ultimately assess new growth. In the Appropriation Committee's report, they concluded that the connection between GFA reductions and the impact on tax revenue is full of complex and contradictory linkages and that it would be impossible to make financial predictions with any useful degree of certainty. Further, that the financial impact on the town is speculative and that the proposed GFA bylaw would not dramatically affect tax revenue. Next, should Article 40 be referred back to the Planning Board? In the early 1990s, the Planning Board put forth what were likely the first zoning articles to address the phenomena of new large houses being constructed in Lexington. Unfortunately, those articles were postponed, and the town would not see action again on this issue until essentially 22 years later. As previously mentioned, in 2020, I brought forth a similar GFA proposal, Article 46, which in June of 2020, during the pandemic, I requested be referred to the Planning Board. Since referring, the Planning Board has shown no formal indication of taking on this work, which can be seen in the Board's own work plan. The work plan for FY22 had 25 formal initiatives across seven different topic areas, and none of them were focused on reducing allowable GFA or addressing large houses on single lots. If Article 40 were to be referred to the Planning Board, there is no clear time frame of if or when the Board might directly engage in this work, and planning staff have reminded the Board that there will likely be still significant work ahead on multifamily housing zoning and regulations after this town meeting. Now to conclude. First and foremost, this article represents a reasonable and tailored approach to adjusting the regulation of the size of houses, which represents an important step forward in addressing consistent resident concern over decades and making progress on long-standing policy goals. It would enable the production of smaller new construction houses, creating a greater spectrum of house size than what we see today. It will create incentives for the renovation and expansion of existing houses in established neighborhoods by retaining current GFA limits for these properties. It would create significant incentives for the creation of conventional subdivision alternatives such as the cluster and multifamily housing bylaws we currently have and those being considered at this town meeting. Lastly, town staff has been part of the process and knows how to implement the bylaw if adopted. Article 40 represents the culmination of hundreds of hours of work over several years and has been analyzed, modeled, and vetted and is ready for your consideration tonight. Our existing GFA bylaw articulates that Lexington seeks to have a socially and economically diverse community and in support of that fundamental social goal, we must strive to produce a range of housing sizes throughout the town that provides the opportunities for the population diversity we seek. 
Toward that end, I hope you will support this reasonable, incremental step forward and will vote yes on Article 40.